He's been running all over the country. He's a big time Democrat these days. The Congressman Cicilline is here. The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you at part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. So, so much to cover with Congressman David Cicilline. This is election, election season. He does have uh, an election here and a Republican opponent who you've met, Patrick Donovan. You'll hear from him a little bit later on in the broadcast. Uh, he was here, I think, a week or so ago. Uh, but I, I think uh, for all intents and purposes, this congressman this time around has got bigger picture things in mind in terms of the national scene, the midterms. Uh, and his bid to uh, to grow his position in Congress. So I'm looking forward to speaking with him about that. Now, look, on Friday nights, as you're watching this, you know that I don't make contemporary commentary because we record the program on Thursdays. And with this news cycle, we've learned since this administration got elected, and even at home here, uh, things happen so fast that I look kind of dumb talking about something that could change. I'm taking a high risk here because I just want to make sure that everyone's been paying attention to this Saudi crisis, and I believe it is one, to be honest with you, uh, and get the congressman's take on it. So here's a headline that was as recent as yesterday because that's when we taped this program that you're seeing now. Uh, the president probably changed his point of view at least two or three times since this particular uh, news production, but at press time, this is what we had. I'm not giving cover at all. President Trump pushed back against critics who say he's letting Saudi Arabia get away with murder. They're an important ally, but I want to find out what happened, where is the fault. The president said he asked Turkey to turn over a recording that state media reports proves Jamal Khashoggi was killed and dismembered after entering the Saudi consulate in Istanbul on October 2nd. I'm not sure yet that it exists, probably does, possibly does. Khashoggi was a critic of the Saudi government. Arab governments have been given free reign to continue silencing the media at an increasing rate, Khashoggi wrote in his final column published in the Washington Post. The Arab world is facing its own version of an iron curtain, imposed not by external actors, but through domestic forces vying for power. Karen Atia is the global opinions editor for the Post. It's a chilling reminder um, to everyone, to the world, that speaking the truth um, can come at the ultimate price. Earlier, Mr. Trump credited the kingdom for supporting his decision to abandon the Iran nuclear deal. We are stopping Iran. We're not trying to stop. We're stopping Iran. And once again, focused on their financial relationship. They committed to purchase $450 billion worth of things and $110 billion worth of military. Uh, welcome. Great to see you. Thanks. Great. You know, yeah. the we have to be really careful not to get all Trump revved up when when crisis like this be, uh, occurs, because there are components of what Donald Trump is saying that are to be factored and contemplated. These are complicated relationships, yet he's got a way, right, to just kind of pigeonhole it into dollars and cents to dehumanize the whole situation. To send messages to the to the world, well, you tell me. I mean, you, no, you, no. I think I you're mean, you and I have never been so consistently visit after visit in the last couple of years on the same page. But hey, that's the way it is. Yeah. No, no. I think you're absolutely right. I mean, the relationships with countries like Saudi Arabia are complicated, and there are lots of reasons that we need to have a relationship with them. The work that that we do together on security, and they're an important alliance in, in many of our defense initiatives, but. It cannot be the case that the President of the United States says to the world that someone who's directed the killing of a journalist for being a critic of, of the government, uh, that somehow we can excuse that because A, he's not a U.S. citizen, B, it didn't happen in America, and C, we've got a lot of business contracts with Saudi Arabia. Well, and, That's and a e, terrible... And, or down on what, and D, at least at the beginning, how about, you know, one, two, or three? I talked to the king, I talked to the prince. Uh, they say they didn't do it. Right. Well, sounds reminiscent of Vladimir Putin, who said strongly he didn't interfere in our elections. So, um, you know, I think it is very disturbing because Americans, America's power in the world is our moral leadership, the, the values that America represents around the world. That's significant in terms of our ability to build alliances, to build partnerships, to advance 
the national security interests of the United States. And when that's undermined by a statement from the president that was re ready to excuse this, it sends a message to other dissidents around the world, other people advocating for democracy, who other journalists who may be uh, frightened about their own futures, that the United States isn't standing for what we thought. So it's very dangerous. We've had some uh, some interesting reflections, mostly off the record, from from both Republicans and Democrats in in Washington from time to time, where you guys all admit that you kind of look at each other across the aisle like, no. Oh, now what do we do with this? We'll take the Kavanaugh thing and put that aside because that was its own unique tussle. But even on the record, Republicans in the House and the Senate, Lindsey Graham Lindsey for Graham one, was very strong. just like, uh, that's right. enough right, right here. Uh, and he had to start walking all that stuff back. Pompeo, Jack Reed says, photo op, not a real visit. What can we expect the pressure in Washington to bring? I think there will be growing and significant pressure from the Congress for the imposition of sanctions and to, for the United States to take a very strong response to this. It, you know, this is a moment of truth for our country. It cannot be that a journalist was killed because he was a critic of the government. You know, sadly, you know, we have a president who talks about the media being the enemy of the people. You know, the, the media plays a very important role in our democracy to bring attention to issues, to inform the public. Uh, there's a reason we call them the fourth branch of government because they play such an important role. And so journalists around the world are threatened with this kind of treatment because they're they're writing about and it's and not always comfortable. I mean, let's not kid no, ourselves. No. I mean, you've been on, I've been the victim. You've of been it. on a pretty good roll uh, lately. Uh, you're, there's not much other than just you know national uh, you know battling issues that that you've had press dealings with, but uh, you and I go way back. I mean, we've had some moments and years, maybe even not speaking. Uh, you're not happy with the paper. You're not happy with me. We're not happy with you. That that stuff's real. Right. And um, that's our democracy. And I may not like it, but I never didn't respect the role of journalists in raising issues and criticizing, whether it's me or other, other elected officials. That's a really important function. And the idea that you have a Washington Post journalist who's writing thoughtful criticism of the Saudi government, that he then goes into a consulate and is killed and dismembered. Um, I mean, it should send chills down everyone's spine. And the United States has to not only condemn it in the strongest terms, we have to do something about it. Here's the question that I don't, I don't know the answer to. What is this story, or how is this story resonating across the country? Uh, you're running around a lot. Um, are you getting a sense that people are saying, Congressman, I don't want to talk to you about this thing, or is it this, just this gnawing, ugly feeling that people have that, man, that's not right? Yeah, I think it's much more the second. I mean, when, it, as in Rhode Island, I think voters are focused on who is going to drive down health care costs and address the real issue of rising costs of prescription drugs, who's going to invest in strategies that raise family income so that I don't have to work three jobs to get by, and who's going to take on in a serious way the corruption in Washington and try to get money out of our political system. So I think, you know, people, voters are always focused on, you know, what are these folks who are running going to do to make my family's life better? I think that's always what you have to answer. But I think you're right. It's more this gnawing, like this is another example of the president not standing up for our values, not standing up for what has made America the envy of the world in terms of our principles, but siding with or appearing to side with or excuse an authoritarian leader, whether it was Erdogan or Putin or now uh, the Saudi uh, prince. By the way, I can never, uh, I can never ignore the commentary that you make about the motivation of constituents. I, I think you're probably right that they're worried about how their families' lives can be made better. But that's part of the problem in politics, I think, today, that we're not thinking about big picture. Look, is, the, is the question anymore ever going to be, how do we make the country better? Can we ever put country first no, no, instead I think of you're how right. me, yeah, how no, no, I, I mean, feel? I, I think, no, no, I think you're right. I mean, I think people believe that if I have, you know, if the economy improves and if we're rebuilding our country and if health care is affordable and if we get money out of politics, that will not only make my life better, it'll make the country better. But I think, you know, people do care very much about the country, but I think they also, you know, people are struggling and people say, like, what are, what are you going to do to actually make my life better? You know, there are so many Rhode Islanders, so many people all across the country that are working harder than they've ever worked, two and three jobs, just not making enough the to get by. The economy is better than it's ever been, the ever, 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 ever. The economy is particularly for the people at the top. 
and particularly with people who have a lot of money in the stock market. But there was a, a report by the Bureau of Labor Statistics just two weeks ago that during the last two years, wages have actually declined slightly for workers. So what we're seeing is an economy that's not working for everyone. For people at the top, the big corporations, the wealthiest Americans, they're doing great. But we have most people that are working harder than they've ever worked, aren't seeing an increase in their income, and everything else in their lives are going up. And so it's a, you know, the economy is improving broadly, but as it relates to individuals and people who are working hard, they've not seen an increase in their income. So you know, that's what I think what Democrats are fighting for is what can we do to really help raise family income so you don't have to work three jobs to take care of your family and get by and try to really you know, put policies into place to increase family incomes uh, and have tax policies that give a tax break to middle class families and not a tax break that 83% of it went to the top 1%. All right, when we come back, we'll talk about that mission, the midterms, and the congressman looking for a leadership role and having to pay the travel price for it. Stay with us. All right, so uh, look at this. Assistant Democratic leader. Most of your constituents don't really know where that sits in the power ranking. What are you trying to accomplish? So that's the fourth ranking position in the House. Uh, and last year I was elected by my colleagues to be, a, to be in the Democratic House leadership as a co-chair of the Democratic Policy and Communications Committee. We worked for the last year and a half to develop the Democratic agenda in the House uh, and to develop a strategy for communicating that agenda to bring us back into the majority. Candidates all across the country are using that. It's an agenda that demonstrates Democrats are for the people of this country rather than for the special interests and lobbyists and that we're committed to driving down health care costs, driving down the cost of prescription drugs, protecting coverage for pre-existing conditions, that we're committed to raising family income specifically by investing in rebuilding the infrastructure of our country, roads, bridges, ports, transit systems, schools, uh, with a plan to create 16 million good paying jobs and really rebuild the country. And third, we're committed to taking on the serious corruption in Washington and particularly the, the really corrupting influence of money in our political system by reversing Citizens so that's, United. So that's the Democratic so, program. So that's what the, do you got to do to win right, this thing? So what's, I, your, what's, your, what's your fee? You have polling data on the membership right not now? Not yet, but so having been elected by my colleagues to, to, to be a coach of the DPCC, uh, it gave me the benefit of not only putting together a good agenda for the country and reflects, I think, the priorities of our state, but for my colleagues to see me doing that work. And so now, uh, after the midterms, we'll have a bunch of new members and uh, we'll elect uh, you know, a speaker, a majority leader, a whip, and a democratic leader. And uh, it's basically talking to colleagues, making my case as to why I think I would be effective in this position. And um, what I'm you know, principally arguing to folks is we're going to have a more diverse and larger caucus than we've had. And I think I have the ability to kind of bring people together and help build consensus uh, and also be effective in communicating the work. So, we're this doing. is something you're doing whether the party wins the midterms or not. In other words, whether the power of Congress changes or not. Correct. So, it remains the fourth position, whether it's to the minority leader or whether it's to the speaker. Correct. Huh. Uh, and the communications position you've had uh, must 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 be one of the rationales, uh, not only your glib skills, but you've been on a lot of national network FaceTime. Uh, you, you feel the need uh, to match this position with that exposure? Is that why no, you're getting I mean, I so much attention? No, the, this position, uh, you know, just like when I ran for the Democratic Policy and Communications Committee, it's a way to make sure Rhode Island has a voice at the table. I was a part of the Democratic House leadership so that every decision that's made about what our priorities will be, what our strategy will be. You know, there's eight of us, and I've been in that room for a year and a half, which means Rhode Island's been in that room. This is an opportunity for me to move up uh, to a higher position in leadership, and the only purpose of it is to give Rhode Island a bigger voice at the table what, in what, Congress. What is the consciousness of the constituency as you, as you run around talking about the need for the Democrats to take the House back? Is it an objective that is locked in to the issues that you just described, or is it a feeling of, we're going to get this guy, this is an impeachment opportunity? What, no, what, I have what, actually, what, what do you think is that? I'm not talking about your priorities no, 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 or what I, you're I, articulating. I haven't, I haven't heard top a of single candidate that I have traveled to help talk about impeachment. Well, I'm talking about people. Uh, or on people. The I think, you Democrat know, there are. Rank and file. I think what people, Democrat rank and file 
understand that there's an ongoing investigation that we should be working hard to protect the integrity of that investigation. We have a number of pieces of legislation to protect Mr. Mueller from political interference or from being fired. And I think there's a lot of consensus that we, look, we demanded that the Attorney General recuse himself because of his conflict. We were successful in getting him to recuse himself. Then Democrats demanded that a special counsel be appointed when it was necessary. We were successful in that. Now we've, we've asked, we have to wait till the special counsel finishes his work. And I think when that report is done, we'll read it and then we'll take the appropriate action. But we need to protect the integrity of that process. But what I hear about from, from people all across Rhode Island and when I'm traveling for candidates is, the, those same issues. People are worried about the cost of health care, about the cost of prescription drugs, whether or not coverage for pre-existing conditions is going to continue. The Republicans are in court right now trying to fight to remove coverage for pre-existing conditions. They've done nothing to reduce the cost of prescription drugs. We've got a real plan to do that. People are also worried about, you know, the federal government sort of abandoning its responsibility to rebuild the country, roads, bridges, ports, everywhere. People understand we had infrastructure that was once the envy of the world. We need to have the federal government be a real partner in that again. And people also understand, and I hear about this all the time, about the corrupting influence of money in our political system. They understand what has happened since Citizens United, that corporations that spend so much money on elections, that so many decisions are being made to benefit the special interests and the big lobbyists, and the voices of the American people are being drowned out. So those are really the issues that Democrats are running I, I'll, on. I'll, I'll give you all of those except the last one. I mean, the the not that I'm not concerned about it as well, but I, I get a general sense that politicians in general are mistrusted, and that while Democrats have the the object the the position of objecting to the current status because it's not in leadership, that you know money is money. The Democrat and Republican Party aren't very much different when it comes to to handling big money. Politics is power. No, no, I, I, I mean, so, I don't disagree. So, with it, but so the problem that, is right. Know? The problem is there's one party. You know, I'm a vice chair of something called the Democracy Reform Task Force, where we have a very detailed plan about passing the Disclose Act, my bill and Senator Whitehouse's bill in the Senate, uh, by a constitutional amendment to reverse Citizens United to get corporate spending out of our elections, uh, and a number of other really good reforms, reauthorizing the Voting Rights Act, automatic voter registration. We have a whole suite of bills that will really repair our democracy. We can't get a Republican co-sponsor on any of them. Mm -hmm. So it may be that both parties are living with the current system, but the Democrats have a real f plan to fix our democracy. And when we yeah. go into the majority, we'll move forward. On the health care thing, though, I think you're right. I think the Republicans feel like they got the job half done at best. And, you know, and, and I'll tell you, entitlements are going to be a big conversation because they're, lo they're looking to pay for this highly leveraged tax cut that they provided. The deficit is going to be at its all-time highest. Uh, and at some juncture, they're thinking, oh, don't worry about that. We just borrowed the money so that we can whack these entitlements back. I don't know how much of America, looking out for itself, is going to be very excited about Medicare, Social Security, and Medicaid getting cut like crazy. Yeah, I mean, first of all, I would correct you on one thing. These are not entitlements. These are earned benefits. People receive Referred med to as. No, that's right. Because it's the common so, vernacular. That's right. They call it entitlements. But these are things that folks have earned. And you are exactly right. The Republicans are now arguing they created a $1.9 trillion debt by giving a tax cut to the richest people in this country and the biggest corporations. And Mitch McConnell said just the other day, and now we're going to pay for it right. by cutting Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. We cannot allow that to happen, and they should be ashamed of themselves for suggesting it. Right. He does have an opponent in this race when we come back. went down there with the idea that I had to, somebody had to, okay, it would, it would have been great if somebody else did it. It would have been fantastic if they had more, uh, I don't know, experience in government, but I don't think that that really is, is necessary because what he's done as our elected representative is, uh, is bupkis and insulting. The idea that he uh, ranted on uh, under, in the struck uh, committee meeting. I was, he looked childish. Your opponent, Patrick yes. Donovan, reaction? Look, I'm very proud of the work that I've done uh, in Congress, uh, delivered real results for our state, uh, brought in over $300 million of federal funding. I've been able to really advance my manufacturing legislation. 
uh, stand up and fight to protect Medicare, Social Security, and Medicaid, fighting to reduce the cost of uh, higher education. Uh, and uh, I'm very proud to be part of a delegation that produces real results, brings real money home, fights for the things that matter to Rhode Island, and delivers results. Talk about the play-by-play -play of that hearing that he points to, though. I mean, you were animated. Mm -hmm. um, I, and I guess, I hate to break it to you, I, I, I couldn't fault you. It, 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 it's a mess down there right now. Yeah. And there are a lot of people who are trying to figure out just common sense, procedure, protocol, transparency, fairness, process, all that kind of stuff. I don't care where you are. If you're an independent like I am, you look and say, I, I can't argue with the Democrats when they're when they're when they're trying to say, well, this isn't fair, this isn't yeah. right, whether it's a Kavanaugh hearing, whether yeah. it's the, the FBI investigation, whether it's the yeah. all of the personnel I mean, issues. The, the the Peter Strzok hearing, which was really, really frustrating, was here you have a career FBI official, been in the in the department I think almost thirty years, a consummate professional. There was uh, uh, text messages that he shared with a friend or uh, someone with whom he was intimate, uh, criticizing Chelsea Clinton, President Trump, a bunch of other folks. And the Republicans attempted to use those text messages to undermine his 30-year career. And despite the fact that it was an inspector general report, which is a 500-page report, interviewed many, many witnesses, read thousands of pages of documents, and they concluded that nothing that was in those text messages in any way impacted the work and the judgments made by Agent Strzok. And I just saw it as really unfair to just basically take this, this text message and try to undermine a, the credibility of the entire department of the Fiora Joe Bureau investigation and the professional work of Peter Strzok. And I, you know, I think the American people saw through it. I think it was unfortunate for the Judiciary Committee of the House to be engaged in this kind of hearing. We have real oversight responsibilities that we should be doing about the Department of Justice, about the child separation policy, about the corruption in the, some of these cabinet positions and some of the self -deal I mean, we've been begging the chairman of that committee, let us do oversight of the real issues, and they have a Peter Strzok hearing about a text message. You know, not, not, to, not to completely join the team here, but this swamp draining exercise seems to be um, yeah. oxymoronic in some ways, don't yeah. you think? I think we are seeing in this administration and the Republicans in Congress who are either accommodating it or remaining silent, the worst corruption of any administration in my life. Economy's good. What is? Economy's good. We're friendly with North Korea. What the hell's your problem? Yeah, I'm, I mean, the economy's good, particularly. I mean, I think the economy is improving, but there are still too many Rhode Islanders, uh, too many people across this country that are not making it, that aren't getting ahead. Uh, we're seeing people at the top doing really well, but we need a set of policies that are going to actually help working families. And with respect to North Korea, Although the president makes it sound like it's all solved, in fact, the North Koreans continue to engage in very belligerent behavior, and we ought to be continuing to sanction them, try to isolate them from the international community and keep the pressure on, uh, because it's, they're not going to stop the nuclear program because Donald Trump says they're good people. All right. Um, good luck in Thank your you. election. But it seems that this constituency of the, of the, the actual Democratic delegation is going to be the one that you're you're most focused on. I'm most focused on my own election here in Rhode Island. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. I hope to you after the election. <laughs> no, it's true. You, you can't run you, 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 you can't out. run for assistant you democratic know. leader if you're not a member yeah, of Congress. Listen, you know, I know a real election when I see one. Um, the longer you go, you know, you stay out of trouble. You might uh, be there for the rest of your life, which is another conversation we ought to have on that term limits thing, but since we don't have them Good luck, and Thank it's great to, it's great to see you. Uh, Davis is with you, obviously. When we come back, we'll tell you what's up next week. Plenty, too. Where are we? See you in a bit. Right back. Right back. <laughs>